Good evening, everybody. As principal, it's my great pleasure to introduce this inaugural lecture, Sailing the Wine Dark Sea, the Archaeology of Roman Crete and the Cyclades, by Professor Rebecca Sweetman. Throughout its history, the University of St. Andrews has traditionally been home to leading classicists. Professor Sweetman is one of the foremost classicists of her generation, who continues on in this tradition through her insightful contributions to classical scholarship, which demonstrate the strength of classical studies and ancient history at St. Andrews on the global stage. Professor Sweetman read for an undergraduate degree in archaeology and classics at University College Dublin, where she focused upon Irish archaeology, working at one point for the Irish Archaeological Survey. After graduating in 1993, she moved to the University of Nottingham, where she undertook a PhD in the somewhat different area of Roman and early Christian mosaics of Crete. This was quite a radical shift of focus, and the transfer between these two distinct areas of history was lucidly described by Rebecca in academic terms as a transition from studying Irish archaeology, quote, to mosaics where you see sea creatures bashing dolphins to death. <laughs> Rebecca's PhD was part funded by the British School at Athens, and upon its completion in 1999, she immediately assumed posts within the organization. After a series of temporary jobs, including Nossos curator and archivist, Rebecca was appointed assistant director of the BSA in June 2000, a position she held for three years. The end of Rebecca's time at the British School of Athens marked the beginning of her time at the University of St. Andrews when she was appointed as lecturer in ancient history and archaeology in 2003. Rebecca was promoted to senior lecturer in 2008 and six years later became pro-dean for the Arts and Divinity curriculum, a post which she held for two years. She stepped down from this role in 2016 before being appointed Professor of Ancient History and Archaeology later that year. Within the School of Classics, she has been deputy head of school intermittently for a total of six years and has very recently commenced as head of the School of Classics. But throughout all this, Rebecca is first and foremost a researcher of great distinction, and she is recognized as a leading world expert on Roman and late antique Greece, and classical Crete in particular. Rebecca has published two books, A Hundred Years of Solitude, Roman Colonies in the First Century of Their Foundation, which she edited and was published by Oxford University Press in 2011, and more recently, in 2013, The Mosaics of Roman Crete, Art, Archaeology and Social Change, published by Cambridge University Press. And I do encourage you to spend time with this splendid and beautifully presented volume. I, I actually have a, a copy in my luggage. I'm going down to London tomorrow and I'm giving it to a, a very special friend of the university as a, as a gift. In recognition of the quality of Rebecca's research, she was awarded a prestigious Leverhulme Trust Major Fellowship in 2015, and she is a fellow of both the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland and the Society of Antiquaries. One of the most distinguishing qualities of Rebecca's career is her expensive time spent in the field. From her time as an undergraduate to the completion of her PhD, Rebecca undertook 124 weeks of archaeological work on 18 different excavation sites in Ireland, Greece, and Bulgaria. And in more recent years, she has been a co-director in the excavation of the Bronze Age city of Philacopi in Milos and co-director of the excavation of a late antique church on the Acropolis of Sparta. Her research is world-leading because it is based upon pioneering engagement with historical and archaeological sites, through the, through the study of which she enlightens us to the everyday lives of people living in classical civilizations. In so doing, she seeks to redress the balance of a self-created image of classical society, which defines itself by massive events such as war. As Rebecca herself has said, if we have a different view on history, that will help us understand where we are today a little better. And Rebecca's research has an immediate effect on helping her students understand the world better. 
Rebecca is a perfect example of why St Andrews is so strong in its delivery of research-led teaching, as she uses her intellectual rigour and academic passion to excite and support the next generation. In 2014, Rebecca received a University Teaching Excellence Award and a Students' Association Award for Honours Teaching, representing recognition from both her academic colleagues and the students whom she teaches. She has also supervised many PhD and Master's dissertations. To Rebecca, her students are developing scholars who form a part of her academic process. As she has said, some of the key joys of working in St Andrews are the abilities to collaborate with lots of different people across faculties, within our own faculty as well, but also with our students. Indeed, cross-faculty work is something that Rebecca widely engages with. Her subject is interdisciplinary at its core, involving art, history, language, and architecture. But the way in which she approaches it speaks to an individual who thrives when working in collaboration. This is particularly clear in Rebecca's activities in the area of 3D modeling and digital reconstruction, which require close working with collection staff and computer scientists at the university. In 2014, Rebecca collaborated with Dr. Katie Stevenson as part of a team that developed the Medieval St. Andrews app, which sought to reshape our understanding of the town of St. Andrews by digitally modeling its earlier architecture. Following this, Rebecca has worked on digitizing the Bridges collection of Cypriot artifacts that form part of our special collections. In this project, poetically named Through a Glass Darkly, Rebecca and her colleagues seek to investigate modes of presenting material objects to enhance the value of time spent interacting with them. This project was of particular interest to His Royal Highness Prince El Hassan bin Talal, Prince of Jordan, when he visited St Andrews last November. It's particularly fitting that we celebrate R Professor Sweetman this evening because at the beginning of last week, the university received the news that it has been awarded sanctuary university status by <coughs> universities of sanctuary. This award, which is a result of a team effort coordinated by Rebecca, recognizes St. Andrews as a place committed to providing a safe environment for refugee and asylum seeking scholars from around the world. And it is a direct result of Rebecca's chairing of the University of St. Andrews Refugee and Forced Migration Network. The voluntary work that Rebecca undertakes in this area evidences her commitment to going above and beyond to shape our academic community and our society more broadly for the better. After tonight's lecture, a vote of thanks will be given by the Dean of Arts, Professor Frank Lorenz Muller. You're then all warmly invited to a drinks reception in Lower College Hall. So I'm now delighted to welcome Rebecca Sweetman to give her inaugural lecture, Sailing the Wine Dark Sea, the Archaeology of Roman Crete and the Cyclades. Please welcome Professor Sweetman. Thank you, um, thank you, Principal, very much for that introduction. Um, I'm slightly taken aback, and I'd just like to go and have a drink now, if that's okay. <laughs> Everybody wouldn't mind. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for coming. It's so wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues and students here, my family. My parents have flown over from Ireland. My kids are here. Well, one of them is missing. <laughs> Any minute now, he'll burst through the door, I'm sure. Um, and just thank you. I mean, it's pretty miserable outside, but hopefully you'll get to see some nice blueness on the sky and the slides in a few minutes. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to Stella, to Shona and Claudia for um, really helping to organize all of this. And I did want to say to everybody too, St. Andrews is a fantastic place to live. And um, I think it's in large part to a really wonderful group of friends that we have here in St. Andrews, and also fantastic colleagues and friends in the School of Classics and in the wider university as well. So let me start uh, now. Um, 
being an archaeologist is one of the best jobs in the world. And um, I still wonder how that happened to be the case, given that, uh, you know, from a very early age, my father put my wellies on here and then shoved me out in a dark field and said, right, we're off to see the sites. Um, you can see he's busily trying to do this on the next generation here, and we'll have a look later on and see whether he's had any success with that. Archaeology is infectious, completely, and I've had the great privilege of having so many students, friends, colleagues, neighbours, and book group, even, who are here, join me on projects uh, in Greece and walking and learning about um, uh, material in Greece. Archaeology is essentially history. It's a particular branch of history, but with the same aim, and that is the study of human society in the past and in the present. But it's got a different methodology, whereas stories that are written down by historians tend to look at the big ideas, as the principal talked about earlier on. Archaeology really um, is looking at the kind of everyday. So what we do as archaeologists is that we look at basically the rubbish that people throw away from the past. So broken bits of pottery, bits of old knives that people don't want anymore, broken bits of armour, that kind of stuff. That's the stuff we look at. So if you want to draw a, a modern analogy, essentially what we are, what archaeologists are, we are like paparazzi. We're like the paparazzi who go looking through people's rubbish bins in order to write up uh, dodgy articles about their lives. <laughs> archaeologists are um, mostly involved in things in landscape, in, in, in material remains. And a big, big part, again, as the principal said, of the work that I do in archaeology is um, finding sites in the landscape. Um, I have focused quite a lot on survey archaeology and um, you know, you, you find sites in a huge range of different ways in the landscape. And actually, um, this slide here, the reason why Aidan is so happy is because it's the first day back on site after Brad had been bitten by a snake. And um, we were always filled with excitement <laughs> and things. He says I didn't do anything to help, but that's a lie, so don't ever let him tell you that. Um, and then we have in one of these, uh, this is uh, Doug, who's one of my PhD students, and his wife, Karen, and they're finding uh, inscriptions and material at the site of Gramata on Syros. So you find sites everywhere, practically, in Greece, and in the most unexpected places, too. So, for example, this um, kind of scree-ridden hill here doesn't look like very much, but actually, when you get to walk on the site, you see broken bits of pottery lying all over the place, and the bucket monkeys, who are Esther Richkutsch and Sam Lister, um, and these are, uh, you'll see their hands feature here, um, they're expert now at picking up bits of Roman glass that we see here, bits of lamps as well, and things like that. Um, so what I'm going to do is have a focus on uh, finding sites in the landscape. Actually, I should have said, this is one of the sites that we found with another one of my PhD students, Halvard. Um, and uh, we came across this church site looking for other things. And when we looked inside this building, uh, which was covered with lots of flaps and things like that, we found um, inside these fridges. But then on the outside, it looked very clearly like something else entirely. And it turns out that it's a temple that um, we really hadn't been recorded in the past at all. In fact, it was called a farmhouse, but I think it was called a farmhouse because a farmer kept his loot in it um, rather than being anything um, important in that respect. So tonight I am going to focus on um, landscape, islands, and um, problems that have uh, kind of permeated through these issues in the Roman and late antique period. The approach to the study of Roman Greece has been somewhat hampered by the way in which um, that period has been viewed through a lens of failure. So up to this point, be they um, mythical uh, sea people, or even very real Persians, the Greeks had faced their enemies with determination and ultimately success. This has contributed to the sidelining of Roman Greece in favor of the supposedly more glorious periods like the Mycenaean or Bronze Age period, like uh, the classical period, and even later than the Byzantine period. The consequence of this is that a traditional view of Roman Greece was accepted, 
one which sees the imperialist Romans go in and demolish the great Greek cities like Corinth that we see here, and even Athens, and then impose their imperialist ideas on the poor old Greeks. Greece, and particularly islands, have suffered in particular for this. Um, Crete and the Cyclades, so we have Crete down here, and I've given you a handout of a map just to keep you ready um, uh, along with what's going on, and actually on the other side of the map is a, a, a plan of the Cycladic Islands, so as I hop around islands you'll be able to um, see where I'm going. Uh, so the, the island of Crete we'll be talking about, and then these are the Cycladic Islands here. So Crete in particular has suffered from this bias, as have the Cycladic Islands, but Crete in part because the kind of shinier periods have mesmerized the archaeologists to a point where Minoan material, as you can see here, and this is quite well-known material, um, the Minoan material kind of entranced the gaze of the archaeologists to the point where very often um, the Roman, the later material, was smashed through or even destroyed and certainly never recorded. For islands in particular, we have a dearth of historical sources, and um, this has meant that we're reliant on a very narrow view. And on top of this, we also have an issue where um, there's an expectation of isolation. Actually, now I show you these maps because some people don't even bother putting the Cyclades on maps. Um, and there's just one random Cycladic island just for fun. Um, we have a situation where um, the islands are kind of marginalized. They're marginalized um, uh, to the point where um, Crete is known as a provincial backwater, so nothing happens on Crete during the Roman period. And then the Cyclades are known in the Roman period, but they're known for being isolated, and they're known only as being good places for exile. So we have an issue. And the problem is one of methodology as well. Not only were these regions disregarded in this way, but the... Um, the stereotype of these regions overshadowed the ability to see the multiplicity of roles that these islands could play, and also the diversity within the islands as well. So what we have is this complete marginalizing and then any ability to see the island's participation within the wider um, Roman Empire. But the other problem is, is that there's an expectation of isolation, there's an expectation that nothing is going to happen, and so um, up until quite recently, archaeologists and historians just didn't bother with the islands because there was an expectation that the material wasn't going to be there. So it was a kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. And actually, as Halvard and Doug, who are both doing their PhDs, will tell you on the islands, there's loads of material there. There's loads of it just sitting on the ground, as we've already seen. Um, and this is partly why fieldwork is so important. It provides the archaeological data that we can start using to construct an understanding of what's going on in the islands in place of um, the, the sources that really don't talk about the islands very much at all. Let's have a look at islands themselves. Scholars have traditionally turned to islands as naturally bound places and therefore really good places for studying um, ideas in, in terms of like a laboratory, like it's an isolated place, you can um, understand what's going on possibly as a microcosm. But th what this is doing, what, by isolating the islands, it's further entrenching islands in this um, idea of um, isolation rather than connectivity. So they're marginal spaces, but the, the fact that they're being studied as marginal spaces kind of ignores the potential for islands to be much greater, much more networked. Essentially, islands have been commonly sidelined by ancient and contemporary writers and archaeologists, essentially due to their islandness. So we have, a, again, a, a, an issue here. So what I'd like to do in this paper is have a look at what's going on on the islands, much more from the perspective of the islands themselves, and um, to see how we can look at the islands from the... Um, uh, uh, um, sorry, I'm slightly distracted by Aiden Hyde. <laughs> See how the islands can be viewed in terms of connectivity and what the different views you can have if you start looking at islands being connected rather than islands as being isolated. What we can see then is how islands as a result, um, how, how they begin to flourish and how they begin to really succeed as spaces can be understood much better when you start looking at them in terms of connectivity. 
In terms of the Cyclades, stories of piracy, exile, and general isolation has meant that the Cyclades, even in contemporary literature, have become a trope for danger. Um, in the 1800s, uh, Thomas Sheridan, and I've got the quote up here, wrote to uh, his friend, Dean Jonathan Swift, who also wrote Gulliver's Travels, of course, um, and he said, this year has been to me like steering through the Cyclades in a storm without a rudder. What he was actually saying was that he was massively in debt and he was asking Jonathan Swift for a loan, but um, by introducing the Cyclades in it, he uh, was emphasizing it a whole lot more. The Cyclades are often discussed as a monolithic group, and because of this, it's very difficult to see how different islands can behave in different kinds of ways. And um, the kind of the diversity of the islands are, is really lost in, in, in the way that they are seen in this respect. In the late 1800s, or mid-1800s, I should say, Mabel and Theodore Bent travelled through the Cyclades um, as part of an even more exotic set of journeys, even down uh, to uh, southern Africa here. And as they were traveling to the Cyclades, and this is um, um, yeah, Theodore Bent wrote these amazing um, catalogues and descriptions of um, ethnography and um, the archaeological material, while his wife Mabel, whose diaries have just been published, just recently been published, wrote far more interesting. I would say, diaries about traveling through her experiences with the people on the islands. And there's one quality story where she goes out uh, with a group of uh, local people on a donkey and she says, and then we got to a wall and they said, do I need help climbing the wall? And I said to them, I'm Irish. Why would I need help climbing a wall? <laughs> so the, the, um, the other thing actually about Mabel Bent was that for the entire Cyclades, she termed the chapter discussing the Cyclades patience. And that, again, kind of emphasizes the um, problematic elements that you can have on the islands. But it's worth having a, a think about who's writing about the islands in these negative terms. Um, now, this is Peg Sayers. And if anyone is actually Irish in the audience, your heart will now have frozen uh, because we were forced to read Peg Sayers' stories which were awful stories about how half her children died, half her cattle fell off the cliff on the, the Blasket Islands here, and how life was really, really, really miserable. Um, and every, every child in Ireland had to read this, in Irish as well, uh, just to make everything worse. Anyway, um, she wrote about how awful the Blasket Islands were, um, but actually, it turns out she wasn't from the Blasket Islands. We were sold a pup. She was from the metropolis of County Kerry, and she married into the Blaskets. So it's no wonder she was given out about the Blaskets all the time. Whereas actually, what we have is this wee fella here, who's um, Jared Kisht O'Cahan, and he um, was one of the last children who was evacuated off the Blasket Islands in the 1950s. Now, this guy, there was a huge newspaper article written about the evacuation, and it said, they called it the loneliest boy in the world. He only has seagulls as playmates. But actually, in his um, autobiography, he's become so famous now, he talks about how he had, he never, it never occurred to him to even be lonely. He had a wonderful childhood. And um, the stories were, of course, written by uh, other people rather than the islanders themselves. In stories, islands are commonly present in mythic and or real circumstances. So think about Atlantis versus the Blaskets. They're seen as representative of the journey. So for example, the Odyssey, where they're traveling around to different islands. But they're also seen as um, places of tension, contradictory places, places full of dichotomies. And a really good example of that is Othello, where um, Othello is set on the island of Cyprus, which at that time is, uh, during the period it's set, island, um, Cyprus is being invaded by the Turks, and uh, we have this very tense situation. And in this quote here, we, we see how it's highlighted, where we have the tension in Cyprus, but also it's kind of um, uh, forewarning us of the tension of uh, what's going to be happening in terms of the um, um, differences, for example, between Othello and uh, Desdemona. Um, but in recent years, actually, there's been an adjustment of the way in which islands are perceived in scholarship. And this is particularly as views of resilience and adaptability begin to underpin interpretations. 
Um, this is paralleled also in studies of ecology and disease as well. And in literature too, where islands once signified remoteness, as mobility across the world increased, so as people became more aware of islands and were able to visit more islands, the idea of a quiet island has actually become a positive. The island as a haven rather than a place of tension and uh, strife. And in light of this, I'd like to see um, islands as pivotal, as hubs, and um, as hubs for the absorption of ideas and then distribution of ideas too. Now, with the islands that we're looking at, with Crete and the Cyclades, it's unquestionable that the islands faced really hard times in the Roman period, or just before the kind of um, end of the first century BCE. Um, they were invaded. Crete was invaded by the Romans, and it took three years for Rome to finally take Crete. Uh, wars, civil wars, were played out in the uh, seas around the Cyclades, and also there were several um, uh, uh, sackings of cities uh, around the Cycladic Islands and Crete too. So they were pretty battered. But after the collapse of Delos, um, where am I? After the collapse of Delos, the Cyclades' major trade and religious hub created these ensuing changes in the networks. And in spite of these setbacks, the islands seem to have rebounded and continued to thrive and remain well networked into the socio-political and religious systems. What we would argue is that the precariousness of their situation made them more resilient. And this is actually shown by the fact that many of these islands in, after the Roman period are of the first in the Eastern Empire to have late antique churches built on them. So they're, they're really leading the way in this respect. Dalberg noted that there are various varying definitions of um, resilience, but for the most part we can take it here as meaning to rebound, and it means the ability to absorb and adapt to change. So bearing this in mind, if we look at archaeology, which allows access to the everyday, the day-to-day -day stuff that's not written down, what we can see is through the application of ideas of resilience, the more optimi optimistic view of life on the islands, rather than the gloom-laden one purported in the literary data. In a sense, the lived experience is the resilient and dynamic one, while the notional one is conservative and isolated. Increasing attention is being paid to the role of networks in resilience, in all sorts of forms. This um, covers biology, business, computers. And very recent research has found that the potential for resilience can actually be measured through networks. But before we talk about that or apply it, let's have a look at uh, what we mean by networks. Networks are essentially um, defined as the means through which information is shared. There are multiple types, such as social, organizational, infrastructural, biological. They can be uh, created or they can grow organically and um, they can be controlled or mediated by different groups. They can be personal or organizational. Networks can be scale-free, so the Roman Empire, for example, is a scale-free network, or they can be small world, which would be like local ones. And highly connected loci within a network are known as hubs, but they don't necessarily have to be significant cities, so a major religious sanctuary, for example, could be a hub. And individual networks are joined together through nodes. And once they are joined together through these nodes, a group of networks joined by these nodes can be called a community, like our book group here. <laughs> Individual communities, so if you have a look at this slide here, this is a community, and each one of these blobs is a node joining other networks. And so the whole thing becomes a community. Um, actually, this is one of the best uses I've ever had for pure. Um, here we have a network. If you were to take out any of those links within this community, this is actually the School of, a of Athens, the School of Classics um, uh, community, networked community. If you take out any of those parts, which is essentially a hub, then it all changes. Actually, you can see it happening on pure. 
it's not that exciting. I made it sound really exciting, but it's not. You take out one of those parts and pure goes crazy and all these new networks and links change and create something different. So that's a, a reasonable example of how a community can be formed. The more interlinked nodes there are in a community, the more resilient it are, is. So for example, the School of Classics is brilliantly resilient because we're made up of a community with lots of different connections with lots of different places. So if you take out, for example, Michael Carroll, that's okay. <laughs> we'll recover. <laughs> because we're so uh, strong as a community, we have lots of links. I'll buy a pint later, Michael. <laughs> We are a community because we're essentially a bunch of nodes within a variety of networks that create different networks as well as having overlapping networks. And therefore, the more, resilient, the more connections we have, the more resilient. There's lots of ways to look for network connections in the past, and pottery is really key to this. And it's really key to particularly showing evidence for trade. But there are other types of evidence too, like epigraphic, literary, numismatic, and architecture. And lots of this material is found through, uh, through excavation. But actually, for the most part, most of what you can really get into is found through survey. And I realized when I was doing a run through the slides that although I have loads of children in the slides, I don't use slave labor um, <laughs> while doing archaeology. Um, in terms of the pottery, what we essentially do is we walk through the sites and we look at the pottery. And a lot of the pottery we then give to Halvard, who's one of our PhD students. And he helps identify the period and uh, the kind of range of occupation for that site. Um, but it's also really important to have a look at the topography. So when you're looking at a map, you get a really reasonable sense of where an island is close to. But until you get to that island, it's very difficult to see how sheer, for example, the, the uh, cliff face is, or how mountainous, or how terrible the vegetation is, or how much scree there is, and how difficult it is to terrace something in order to make any kind of agriculture. So it's really, really important to get a good sense of what's going on on the islands um, too. And the other thing is, it really enhances the idea of network connections. So Doug, who's doing his work um, on connections in the archaic period, and earlier actually, um, he knows the sailing routes through the islands really well, and that's a, a really important aspect to know too, that you know, sailing from, if I get this wrong, Doug, don't kill me, sailing from Tinos up to Andros is a bad idea, but sailing from Andros down to Tinos is okay because of the wind. Altogether, a combination of the networks and resilience means that we can have a really good way of looking at islands and highlighting otherwise unrecognized relationships, as well as helping to see how these seemingly isolated communities can play such a significant role in something as massive as the Roman Empire. But let's have a look at Crete to start. Um, it's important to note where Crete is. So we've got Italy here, North Africa, Libya here, um, Egypt along here. And Crete was always buzzing. It always had huge networks um, right from the Bronze Age period onwards across the Mediterranean and uh, indeed with the Cycladic Islands in the earlier period. A study of Crete can show that networks can be made, that they don't just have to grow organically, um, that networks can be made to suit the people who are living on the island, but also to suit the, the, the kind of higher powers, be it the Romans in this situation, as well as taking into account other people. But from historical sources, such as Livy, Dio, Diodorus, what we get uh, about the island of Crete is, is that it was a really crummy place to be. In the Hellenistic period, it was nothing but people who were duffing each other up. There were people, cities were at war with each other, they fell out with each other constantly. And the kind of notion is, in the sources, that the Romans went into Crete in order to stop the warring islanders. Now, they went into Crete to stop the warring islanders and it took them over three years. But as a result, what they did was they created a colony, a Roman colony at Knossos, which is here, now, it was interesting because Knossos put up the most resistance to the Romans. They held out at Knossos for a very, very long time. But they put a colony here, which is meant to be like a, a very well-invested uh, Roman city. And then they made Gorton the capital of the island. So it was the capital of the joint province of Crete and Cyrene. What we see 
is not really a situation where um, everything is fine after the Romans go in. In fact, quite often what the sources say is the Romans went in and then the next morning everybody woke up and found themselves to be Roman. It's not true. The next morning everybody woke up and found that things hadn't changed on the south coast and things hadn't really changed on the north coast either. On the south coast, they'd already been well networked into the Roman network. They'd already been hanging out with traders who were moving across, and this is the Orbis um, map, which is great fun if you ever need to try and write something and can't. Um, they were, uh, you can plot in the direction of travel in the Roman period. So we, if we look at the south coast of Crete here, the direction of trade from Italy across to Alexandria is taking in the south coast of Crete. And you need to take in the south coast of Crete because it's really bad sailing around here. So you essentially want to hug land um, or else you're going to get into trouble. And there are lots of shipwrecks um, around this area too, just to prove the point. So what we see on the south coast is in fact a situation in places like uh, Lysos here, uh, in Gorton, in Lebana, and in Myrtos, a situation where actually, right from the kind of middle of the first century BCE, they were already in touch with lots of Roman people. This is the site of Lysos, which you now can only get to either by boat or by trekking over a gorge. It's completely uninhabited. But on the site, there's lots of these kind of double-barreled vaulted tombs. Now, these tombs are not found anywhere else except for Lysos, Lebina, which I showed you earlier on, Italy, and specifically Campania, and then a small tiny town in the south coast of Turkey. And so that suggests there's a particular group of people who are building these tombs who have connections with Italy and this other place in Turkey, but nowhere else um, outside of the south coast of Crete. Also at Lysos, you take my word for this, this is the Roman um, mosaic that's mostly found uh, in the western part, so uh, more commonly found in Italy, in a Roman podium-style temple. So this is in meant to be Hellenistic Crete, where they're all kind of backward and not doing very much. But lo and behold, we have a, a city that's showing quite progressive ideas already. This is uh, Lebena down here. And here we have a similar situation where we've got a very Roman type of temple, a podium temple, um, again with a mosaic, although this uh, mosaic is a wee bit earlier, um, but lots of imported material coming in Lebena. As I said, Gorton had become the capital of the island. And um, you would expect um, there to be quite a lot of uh, evidence of military organization, particularly if it's the Romans taking over, um, or, or kind of any kind of tension, but it's not the case at all. What we see is a continuation of building of temples, like we have here with the Temple of Isis. There's a Roman Odeon. But in fact, most of the epigraphic material talks about um, uh, that talks about merchants and bankers and people who are living there who are creating a, an economy. They're trading and using Gorton as a base for that. And then along the island, we have a, a, an impluvium um, style house here, which again is a Roman form. And um, this is a Ro <laughs> this is a terrible, this is the only surviving photograph of this mosaic, which is now destroyed, unfortunately. Um, again, because the Roman material wasn't uh, very well um, taken care of. Um, but this is a, another very, very Roman, uh, Western type mosaic, I should say. So what we see is that these Western towns, or so the Southern towns made the most of the East-West trade or the West-East trade um, across the South coast of Crete. But at the same time, you would expect some sort of change or impact in the North because, you know, it's now part of the Roman Empire but there is nothing, no change, no change in Knossos. Everything happened. It's meant to be a Roman colony, but there's no change in the city at all, um, not for a whole century. The Hellenistic tomb types still continue. Most of the pottery still continues. The only thing that's really changing is that there are a couple of official inscriptions that say, this is a colony. But you know, on the ground, there's nothing to suggest that there's very much change at all um, at Knossos until the kind of uh, late first century, early second century. And then there's a massive change, not just in Knossos, but all across the north coast of Crete. And what we have is that it's manifested in huge investment in housing with lots of uh, very fine mosaics. This is in Kishimos, which is in the northwest part of Crete. Again, um, more housing here with uh, uh, more mosaics. And then 
lots of evidence for luxury items showing up across the island. So luxury items including imported uh, marble, uh, amphora, which is not a luxury item, I suppose, but um, you're, it's showing evidence for lots of trade across the island. And also, the other thing that they're doing at this point is they're investing in infrastructure. So, for example, the aqueduct, which comes out of Hersonisos on the north coast as well, um, and kind of fish tanks as well. So industries are being built up on the north coast. And what I think is happening is that the south coast has been benefiting massively from the trade coming across, and it's doing really well. And then the north coast kind of thinks, oh, we could do that too. And they, take, uh, they benefit from possibly Crete as an entrepot. So if you look at this point here, this is um, Ayas Nicolaos here, and then there's a, a, several ports up here. And this is the shortest traveling point across the island. And actually, it's really easy to travel across the island at this point. It's a really nice valley, uh, and then you get to the end of it, and then there's some really nice ports there. So it may well be that material is carted across the island at this point uh, for redistribution, possibly, um, but certainly within the island, uh, there's evidence of that. So we're, we're getting... Uh, evidence of access to luxury items in the second century, which we haven't before. But the other things that's happening is that on the island, there are lots of changes. Lots of craftspeople are coming into the island, and we can see that they're having connections with um, uh, people in uh, Anatolia, people in uh, the west coast of Asia Minor, and in mainland Greece as well. So as um, as uh, the island is flourishing, um, so too are the networks. And you can see how these networks are building and building and building. But at the same time, Crete is not losing sense of its um, kind of self in the sense that uh, the uh, labyrinth is continued to be used on the back of Roman coins. And also, um, this is one of the first of these types of statues, which is a statue of Hadrian. And it shows Athena here, which is the owl and the, the snake, standing on the back of the she-wolf who's suckling the twins, which is not really an imperialist Roman kind of statue to, uh, to have. <coughs> so what we have now is a situation where um, it's likely that you know, they're engineered network connections in order to make Crete, um, in order to make the islanders of Crete um, earn a profit, essentially. Um, what we see is the island was invaded, the south was profiting already, and then the north was stable, and then the north profits. And it bounces back um, to an even better position than it was. So it seems that Crete's reputation for isolation in the sources is in part based on this kind of nebulous idea that it was war-torn and nothing could ever happen. The same idea is kind of seen in the Roman Cyclades, where uh, they're written off largely because of the idea of the islands being used for exile um, and uh, isolation. And the sources do talk about exile. They talk about it. Um, they talk about uh, lots of people being exiled uh, at various different times. Historically, Delos, which is that very small dot in the center of the Cyclades, was actually one of the most networked places um, in the Hellenistic period and in the Roman period until the kind of mid-first century BCE when Mithridates went into the island and completely destroyed the island. Um, it was uh, an incredible hub. It was not just a hub for trade, but it was a religious hub as well. Um, and actually, I wanted to show you these slides. This is Anthony Gormley's got an exhibition on Delos at the moment, uh, which is just running out. But they're fantastic uh, figures of these individuals uh, scattered around the, the very... Um, very otherwise bare island. There's nobody living on the island or anything like that. And then you've got these figures. But the, the quality figure is actually this one, um, of, of a figure lying down in the museum, which I've seen my children do a few times. <laughs> and actually, I suspect most adults would want to do it too. Um, anyway, the Gormley exhibition is on now, if you still, if for another three weeks, if you want to try and get out to Delos. So Delos was an incredibly well-networked place in uh, the 3rd, 2nd, and 1st century BCE. But when the Romans came in and smashed up, or sorry, Mithridates came in and smashed up the island, you have a situation where the hub is taken out. And so um, the hub is taken out, and then people scatter, and they start to create new hubs around the Cyclades. Now, 
what traditionally is considered to have happened is Delos is taken out, and then after that, the Cyclades just fail. That nothing happens on the islands, that they're all just a bit um, out of the way, and um, only really useful for sticking exiles there. But really, what we start to see when we look at the islands is something else entirely. The network is gone, and if you start looking at these individual islands like Milos, you can start to see how the networks are reforming. Now, Milos is a fantastic island in that it's got these, it's like a, it's a volcanic island, uh, or was created through volcanic um, activity, but it's got all these huge resources of minerals, so sulfuric minerals, and you can see in this very small slide... Uh, the different colours in the, um, and, and the uh, cliff edge. But what they did in the Roman period was they began to mine alum. Now, alum is an incredibly important um, element in lots of medicinal products in the Roman period. And the, the locals probably mined alum and the Romans probably went in and mined alum to the extent that these alum amphora were created on Milos in order to export the alum across particularly into Italy. And in Italy, they started to find all these million amphora there, showing that they're networking across uh, different parts of uh, the Roman Empire. But they were really smart about it in, the, in uh, Milos, because the other thing that Milos had was lots and lots of ports. And so they could, in any kind of weather, essentially ship out the alum. So if it was bad wind from the north, they could go to a, a well-sheltered port on the south and ship out the alum. So nothing was really going to interrupt these uh, kinds of connections. And you can see in the archaeological record on the ground that Milos really flourished as a result of all the alum exports and other things that had hot springs as well. Um, so we have Milos really flourishing. All the epigraphic data shows that there's quite wealthy families living on the island. Now, there was one thing I should say in that the islands were hampered by a lack of land. And if you wanted to progress in terms of wealth in the Roman period, you really needed land behind you. But we have lots of evidence for wealthy traders, people investing in the island too. The other place that um, is kind of a similar place that it becomes a hub is the island of Paros. Now, on Paros, what we have is lots of epigraphic evidence. We have epigraphic evidence for people who are working in the mines, people who are lease and, uh, mines, quarries. I should have said Parian marble. So one of the most uh, well-known and sought-after marble comes from Paros, both in the you know, classical period as well as through the Hellenistic and in the Roman period. So this Parian marble, for a long time people thought that the Parian marble industry had declined in the Roman period, but actually so many of the inscriptions are saying otherwise. We've got inscriptions talking about the leasing of the quarries, uh, we've got inscriptions talking about whole families like the Costuti who go in and they have, we can trace their network connections. So the Costuti, for example, have connections in Aphrodisias and Eos as well as in Italy as well. The Babuli family as well, they have connections both in Asia Minor and in Italy too. So this epigraphic evidence, we can trace where these people are going to around um, around the empire, and a lot of it is centering on Paros. So we can already see that this hub is being created on Paros. The other thing about um, the, uh, this hub was the fact that the marble itself was really well regarded, and so it went everywhere. It went to Rome in particular, so the Creeping Odysseus, for example, here, and the, the sculptors too. So you can imagine that it's not just the marble that's creating these connections, but the sculptors, the owners of the mines, and then all that um, other stuff that goes with it. So you can see how well Paros is networked and to the very variety of places that it's networked to. We can see that the island benefited from this. Um, there's lots of developing uh, evidence for imports, uh, lots of developing evidence for imports from Asia Minor in particular, and also, uh, you can see it on the ground in terms of the material culture. So lots of uh, really fancy funerary monuments, mosaics and things like that um, appear in the Roman period where there weren't really uh, huge amounts of material like that before. Other ways that connections can be made are through religious connections. And again, Paros has that in terms of various cults that are not found very often outside of the Cycladic Islands. 
Um, so, for example, uh, the Kaborai cult, which is found in Asia Minor, and then on Baros and one other island in the Cyclades. So religious networks, too, create um, these further networks within the islands as well. And for all they give out about the, uh, the exiles, exiles themselves create network connections. And we can see this really clearly in the Cycladic Islands. So we know from uh, historical sources that there were about at least 150 people. So we know 150 people were exiled in the Roman period. The number is likely to be way, way more than that, but those are at least uh, the numbers that we know of. And a large number of them were actually exiled to the Cyclades. So the main islands that were used for exile, you can see up here, Kithnos, Gyaros, uh, Naxos, Syros, islands like that, Amorgos. But notably, the most connected islands, Paros and Milos, did not have exiles on them. So they really are sending them to places that are kind of out of the way in terms of their views of uh, how well connected they are. Exiles can actually, uh, you know, the, the negative view of exiles can be kind of transposed into a more positive view of diaspora. And what we have with a lot of the exiles is that their families followed them, they settled in some of the islands, and they became part of the community. And in lots of places, particularly in Andros, for example, there's inscriptions, there are dedications to the exiles who invested in the community, and they too are creating lots of links with other people. Uh, this, um, uh, the philosopher, there was a, a philosopher who wound up on Yaros, lots of his fans went to see him, uh, and as the philosophers have lots of fans. Um, a, uh, an astrologer, wound up on Shadowfoss, and all his business came. Um, and so you have this huge network of people that are, are created because of the exiles. Now, I'm not saying that they're long-lasting, but in some cases they do with the, the investments like uh, the family on Andros. But um, the exiles sometimes had to go home again, and then those networks would break again too. Tourism also created lots of different networks, and the islands, as they are today, had many sites that were attractive to people to visit. So, for example, the sanctuary of Poseidon and Amphitrite on uh, Tinos was well known for its uh, festival, the Poseidona festival. Uh, but there are snakes in that sea, according to the guy who runs the uh, site hut, so don't go swimming there. Um, and the sanctuary of Poseidon and Amphitrite had huge numbers of visitors. But it's probably, too, because Tiberius, the emperor Tiberius, gave it a so it gave it asylum as well, which created another reason for people to go and see um, the sanctuary. Um, the sanctuary of Dionysus, which would be very appealing today, and may be familiar in the sense that it had a miracle at the sanctuary of Dionysus, in that the river that normally flowed by the sanctuary turned into wine during the celebration, the Dionysiac celebration every year. And so lots of people went to visit the island for that reason. But there's all sorts of different kinds of investment on the islands. There's investment from the military, investment from emperors. Um, and we can see, it, particularly on places like Andros, that there is a massive uh, flourishing of the islands as a result of all the networks. Um, other kind of tourist uh, trap things that you could see the tomb of Archilos and the tomb of Homer. Well, I mean, that's a nonsense, that tomb of Homer, obviously, but, um, but it's, st it's still there today. Um, so you have these huge networks created through tourism, through exile, imported, exported pottery, uh, people moving around the place, traders, merchants, uh, quarry workers, sculptors. So in fact, when you start looking at the material, the islands are incredibly well networked and not really all that suitable for, um, uh, for um, exile, or at least some of them were not that suitable for exile. If you push it forward a little bit, what you see in the third century is places like Cyclades and Crete booming. So in the third century, there's kind of not, life's not great in the Roman Empire in the third century, but on the islands, life is good. Um, there's lots of material from the third century, lots of work going on in terms of sculpture. There are other really neat things happening in the islands in the third century in that um, the islands see for the first time women turning up on sarcophagi and women being on their own on sarcophagi, whereas really in other places you have to have a man reclining with you on a sarcophagus, but on the islands it's women on their own. So it's suggesting a difference in kind of maybe even landholding or wealth um, uh, 
uh, where wealth is being positioned within the families. And the other thing that happens on the islands is that the islands see, for the first time, some of the earliest late antique churches built on them. So in the fourth century, you get the Catapoliani church constructed at Parachia and Paros, and also you get the Aierini church constructed on Sierra. Churches on mainland Greece do not get constructed until the late 4th, early 5th century. So they're almost 100 years before what's happening on mainland Greece here on the islands. So what we see here is that islands by their nature will experience change and adopt new ideas faster than mainland locations, but only if the islands are already part of a network. So some of the islands that, you can, that we didn't really talk about, like Agiaros, is not connected in any way. It can't sustain connections, so it's not really in the picture. The state of being islands has, been, has a significant impact on how easily, and in some cases how successfully, change is incorporated. This is due to a range of reasons. Existing complexity, openness to new ideas, accessibility and resilience. Adaptability and resilience is most striking in, visually in terms of Christianization. And here, and again, in terms of Christianization, what we have is a situation where Christians and polytheists lived side by side, drawing on each other's iconography and indeed in, in, in cult practice too. And in many respects, this is what uh, typifies the islandness of both Crete and the Cyclades, the successful coexistence of sets of dichotomies. And I will finish with this one. To answer whether my father was successful in indoctrinating my children into archaeology, while we were sitting having dinner, this is what they did. They went off and found a site and uh, piled up the pottery and then took us to see it. Thank you very much. Principal, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, but especially dear Professor Sweetman. If there was ever any doubt as to the contemporary relevance and topical edge of humanities disciplines such as archaeology or ancient history, then Professor Sweetman's dazzling talk will certainly have dispelled it. Her lucid and learned discussion centered on a question that seems to me to be very much at the heart of our national debate right now. What is it that gives resilience to islands that are located at the periphery of larger political, cultural, and economic systems <laughs> and are partly inhabited and invigorated by interesting exiles from foreign shores? <laughs> Friedrich Schlegel once described historians as backwards-facing prophets. And true to this definition, Professor Sweetman has analyzed the stony debris of an ancient civilization to answer her question in a manner that points to the future. Her conclusion is as fresh and convincing for our present day as it is for her exploration of the Cyclades and Crete. Deep, vibrant, and multifaceted connections, social, organizational, infrastructural, and biological networks, these make all the difference. The potential for resilience, Rebecca has told us, can be measured through such networks, and it is by paying attention to the stories told by these networks that we can better understand the true nature of the waxing and waning of the fortunes of these island communities. Her thesis allows us to discard old narratives and outdated cliches and to generate a more convincing, more securely grounded, and more reflective answer. This is precisely the task that scholarship sets for itself, and Rebecca has tackled it brilliantly. If you have a hammer, it is said, everything looks a bit like a nail. And as you know, my hammer is the 19th century. So I could not resist the temptation to try and explore Rebecca's question about resilience in the wine dark sea with the help of a 19th century source. This took me after quite a lot of research uh, to James Theodore Bent, who was not mentioned in the script that Rebecca gave me 10 days ago, <laughs> which makes my utterly original contribution now seem somewhat flat, <laughs> but undeservedly so. So he was a Yorkshire-born Victorian, as you know, with an itchy foot, 
who traveled across much of the Mediterranean world, including the Greek islands, and he did so together with Mabel, his irrepressible Irish wife. <laughs> In 1885, Ben published The Cyclades, or Life Amongst the Insular Greeks. The sketch of Anafi, one of the many islands he portrays in this book, provides a complementary explanation for the resilience of these islands, and one that also seems to me to be timelessly Greek. Everything is done at home in Anafi, Dent wrote. Their windmills grind their corn, their fields produce a sufficiency of grain, their looms make all the materials for their clothes, their hill slopes produce excellent grapes. If the rest of the world was to disappear, said the local governor, and enough we alone be left, the only thing we would miss would be tobacco. <laughs> and relative to the subject of tobacco, I asked him if he approved of the new tax the Greek government had recently put on cigarette papers. Bah, exclaimed he with a wink, the tax has not yet reached Anafi. <laughs> and the chief functionary of the law chuckled to himself as he rolled a cigarette in smuggled paper. This intrepid Victorian traveler, Bent, and his photographer wife, crisscrossing the Mediterranean together, bring me to another aspect of Rebecca's lecture tonight, the image of her field walking for miles and miles across the archaeological legacy of these many cultures, or of her digging archaeological trenches, ably assisted on occasion, I am told, by the directors of strategy and of the global <laughs> office, faithfully serving as Rebecca's bucket monkeys. <laughs> Her hands-on, active, sun-drenched form of research brings to us, to this lecture hall, to the pages of the books in our library and in the principal's luggage, the excitement of new findings from distant shores and an ancient past. This speaks to a second central task of the scholar, to connect audiences with the worlds of knowledge and discovery, to go out and bring back something hitherto unknown and to communicate it, ideally, in as colorful and captivating a way as in tonight's lecture. It is therefore not really surprising that this scholarly task is generally understood to be carried out with particular panache and spectacular daring by archeologists. But when it comes to explaining how network theory can help us better understand the resilience of the Cyclades, what have Indiana Jones and Lara Croft ever done for us? <laughs> Nothing. For this, we need a much more engaging scholar and we are fortunate to have one right here. Rebecca, on behalf of everyone in this hall, I would like to thank you for your splendid lecture. True to Cicero's dictum, docere et delectare, you have taught us and delighted us. It's a pleasure to have you as part of our resilient network.